What a great um, presentation. Uh, this, looking forward to this. Uh, I'm not going to mention anything about it because Julie, Juliet will do that a good job with that. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Juliet Pelinches, to talk about the blue zones and the fact that we've got one or an area working on it real close to us. So Juliet, take it away. Hi, John and everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Julia. It's a pleasure to be here with other kindred veggie folks. As someone said in the chat, this is very exciting. I am uh, presenting to you from down in Roseburg, Oregon. And down here, we are a Blue Zones Project demonstration community, but I also am the executive director of a nonprofit called UC Veg. And we do a lot of the uh, similar programs that our, our big brother or sister up there, Northwest Veg, does in your community. And so it's really fun to, to share with you and to be able to present with all of you. I have great respect for all of that, what you do up there. And we try to replicate a lot of that down here. So I'll try to uh, weave some of that into uh, the presentation today. But this is mostly going to focus on uh, Blue Zones Project. But I will say too that we have paused our monthly potlucks as well. And I just was inspired by this and thinking that we should, we should resume those virtually and invite our speakers back. So um, we'll see if this goes well. If it does, then we'll probably be following suit. So again, uh, Julia and my, uh, my work with Blue Zones Project is, has been going on for about three years, but I've been working in community well-being for quite some time and that gave me the background to be able to really appreciate what I get to do with Blue Zones Project. My title is Engagement Lead. Um, I serve on several different boards here in our community. Um, my, my goal has really been to help our community reach, reach its full potential and this opportunity with Blue Zones Project. Uh, I'm saying, seeing someone saying that they can't hear me. Can anyone hear me? I am not on mute and I see that, okay, someone's saying they can hear me just fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and proceed then. And I hope that whoever said that can, can, can figure that out. I apologize for that. So, and I hope everyone can see the slideshow. This is Blue Zones Project. So today I'm gonna share with you about the secrets to longevity from the places around the world where people are living the longest healthiest lives and what we can do here in, in Oregon and around our communities and in Washington uh, to, to uh, improve our longevity to lead to a longer, healthier life. So let's get this, this slideshow going. So we, we are seeing, and I'm, I'm sure you all can, uh, you know, this resonates with you that it's getting harder to live a, a healthier life. Uh, we know that 60% of our population can be classified as overweight or, or obese. Um, for the first time in history, it's projected that our children, well, life, life expectancy will be shorter than that of their parents. And our environments increasingly encourage unhealthy behaviors. And many of you may have heard about loneliness and isolation being risk factors for increased mortality and that just being um, sort of a, a new uh, pandemic in, across the globe, if, if I could use that word. Um, and I, I'm seeing someone saying they don't, they can't see the slideshow, they just see John and I. So I'm going to ask again, can anyone, ideally you would see the slideshow and you'd see me in a little video bubble on the corner. Does anyone We're see that? Seeing. We're not seeing. Not, no one is seeing that. I see John, I can't see the slideshow. Okay. So let me try to unshare and then reshare my screen here. See if this will work. How about now? Yep. Okay, well, that wasn't too hard. I'm gonna go back just, just real quick. That was the first slide. Oh, hi. <laughs> and now I'm here on the second slide. Okay. So we are applying evidence-based best well-being best practices from Blue Zones Project communities across the country. And uh, also from the original Blue Zones, and we'll take a, a tour through those Blue Zones communities here shortly. So many of us think that we are victim to our genes, right? Whatever our parents brought us in with, that's what's gonna happen. 
um, but, but potentially in this group, maybe exposed to some, you know, more positive science and, um, you know, some of the new things that are coming out, you might know that only about 20% of our longevity is impacted by our genes and the rest is our lifestyle and environment. And I forget which of, of our plant-based docs says this, but someone said that genes load the gun, but it's our lifestyle that pulls the trigger. And I like to joke that that's a very, very Oregonian way to put it. <laughs> so we think that there is a, a better way to live longer better. A team of National Geographic demographers went around the world to really truly find those places where people are living longer better. They're living to age 100 about 10 times more than we are here and with a fraction of the chronic illness team of demographers you can imagine they went around we're looking at birth certificates death certificates cause of death all of these things to really truly identify those places that are blue zones or longevity hotspots so that's dan butner he's a national geographic fellow um, that is you know one of the best selling national geographic magazines of all time about these blue zones there was another one that came out more recently so let's take a little tour around the globe to find those five longevity hotspots. Here they are. And if I could hear you, I would ask you if there was anything that surprised you on here. And the reason I ask that is because there is one that often surprises people. And um, for whatever reason, we don't usually expect to see a blue zone right here in the United States. Um, but there is Loma Linda, California. And some of you might already be thinking, I know why. And we'll get to that. We'll see if you're right. Um, in fact, you can put it in the chat. Put it in the chat if you think you know why Loma Linda has a greater longevity than the rest of the United States. So in these places, people are living, are three more, times more likely to live to age 100. They get 12 more good years than the average person living in the United States. So again, they're not living long, thick lives. They're living longer, better, as we like to put it. So let's start with Sardinia, Italy, home to the longest living men in the world. Now, Sardinia is a very rocky, rugged terrain, and they typically have been uh, traditionally shepherds. That was their, their pastime. That was the way that they spent their time. You can imagine navigating around, up and down that rocky terrain um, all the time. There's a lot of natural movement. We call it moving naturally. It's not sitting all day like I often am, you know, at my desk job and then running to the gym for 30 minutes and getting a little movement and then going back to sitting. It's just a natural kind of gra gradual movement that happens throughout the day. Um, in Sardinia, they have one person living to age 100 or one centenarian for every 250 people. That sounds like, oh, that's cool. But compared to us in the United States, on average, one person, one centenarian for every 6,000 people. So big difference there. And I'm going to jump back to this slide to just share a little bit more about what they're doing there. The men in Sardinia, or the, the population in Sardinia, also eat largely a plant-based diet. And they're growing a lot of their fresh produce right in their backyard. So not only are they getting that direct access to fresh produce, but they're also getting, for the gardeners that are on here, you know, that constant movement, you know, squatting, digging, hands in the soil, out in fresh air. So really a, a supportive uh, practice for a lot of reasons. But, um, you know, of course, reaping, reaping the benefit with that fresh produce. Uh, they also, um, you know, in addition to just be, to being plant-based, they're not 100%, right? They're not necessarily vegan or even vegetarian. They do eat some animal products, but they do it much more infrequently than the average person living in the United States. I like to joke that, you know, for most people here, I know not in this crowd, but most people in this country, it's like the steak is the dinner and there's that little garnish on top and we kick it off to the side because that's not food, right? We're eating, we're there for the big, red, you know, meaty, bloody thing. And that's just not how they do it. And in Sardinia, nor, nor is it the case in the other blue zones, they see animal products as something to be used for celebratory purposes in much smaller quantities when they eat it. Sometimes they can say it's like about the size of a deck of cards, or they're even just using it as a condiment. So much less uh, animal product, uh, product intake. They also have a practice called uh, wine at five or friends at five, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. They have uh, a, <laughs> a wine in uh, Sardinia that's one of the highest in polyphenols, high in antioxidants, 
But what's more important about the beverage that they're drinking is that they get together regularly with their friends. They get together and they share the highs and lows, ups and downs of, of their days, and they're really investing in that social network. And I think for a lot of us, we can think, you know, what does that look like for us, especially during these times? What does our social network look like? I'm sure for many people on this webinar today, this is really nice, right, to have some social interaction as much as we possibly can. So um, really thinking about investing in your friend group and your friendships as part of your health regimen, that, that is so important. That's a pattern that we see across the blue zones. Okinawa, home to the longest living women in the world, Okinawa, Japan. And this is, I think, probably one of the most well-known blue zones. Often when I talk about blue zones, people recognize that Okinawa is a blue zone. They've heard of that, that, uh, that place before. Um, and so this is uh, off the, co the, the archipelago off of the coast of Japan. And again, women are, I'm sorry, all the populations, home to the longest living women, but the population, they're also largely eating a plant-based diet. So we're seeing that theme there. Uh, not only though, do they know kind of what to eat, they also have a really interesting practice of how they partake the food. Before every meal, they say harahachibu, harahachibu, which kind of roughly translates to let's only eat until we're 80% full. So they are constantly reminding each other, don't stuff yourself at this meal. Let's try to leave a little room for digestion. And, you know, of course, that's good for, for the gut. And if you can imagine if a generation is always practicing this, that can be the difference between an overweight generation and a generation of a, of a comfortable and healthy weight. And I always find this one to be really challenging for me personally, because I don't know about you guys, but I think in this country, we really reward eating big, eating big quantities. Um, you know, in our family, my brother and I, we had eating contests, you know, where we would get a whole big Taco Bell family meal and we would compete to who could eat the most. And even if you weren't as extreme as our family was, there's Thanksgiving, a, a, a day of the year where we basically plan to overeat. So this is, this is a part of, of our culture. And I think it's a, it's a tricky one to undo. Now there's something called the Framingham study that showed that about 20 years ago, the average person had three close friends and now that number is about one and a half on average. So again, looking at your friend group, how are you investing them? You can imagine why, you know, that may have changed. Maybe it's technology, maybe it's because our lives are so busy. Um, lots of things that we could attribute that to. Um, but we know that Isolation and loneliness are big problems. Um, loneliness, we see on the site, says has the same impact on longevity as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So this is very serious. Again, like I said, something we want to be considering as, as a real part of our health regimen, getting together with friends. So kind of, kind of a fun one, but something that we should definitely take seriously. Now to combat that in Okinawa, Japan, the reason we bring out that issue is because Okinawa has a really unique way of solving for this. So they have a concept called a moai, a moai, M-O-A-I. And a moai is just a, a small group of people that meet together for a common purpose. That's really the most generic definition of a moai. But specifically in Okinawa, what that, what that looks like is uh, parents will put their children into small groups of, you know, five to 10 children, and then they'll cultivate those friendships as the kids grow up so that they have those same friendships or that same core group over their lifetime. Uh, and the reason for that originally was to support people during financial ups and downs, um, you know, other difficulties that people face so they can always turn to that support group. Now, these women, these women here in Okinawa, Japan, now I wonder if you were to see these women walking down the streets of Vancouver, how old would you think they are? I mean, they look, they look kind of elderly. They look pretty healthy, right? Um, I usually, when I ask this, people say, you know, 80, something like that, something, something around that. Well, average age of this group of women is 102. And these women have been friends for 90 years. So they are a part of that really traditional concept of, of a Moai. Very beautiful uh, relationship that these women have. Two of them live across the street from each other. Every morning, they open the door, they wave to each other, good morning. 
and you know chat or whatever maybe they're coming over to each other's house later imagine what you think would happen if one of them opens the door one morning and the other one doesn't one of what do you think is going to happen if that's their tradition every single morning and i can't hear your answers but i'm going to answer for you <laughs> so probably they're going to go check on each other right someone's going to walk across the street and see how they're doing and i just want you to just take a second to think about the sense of security that you might feel if you knew you had that in your life you knew someone really had had their eye on you and in the best uh in the best way that they were really looking out for your well-being and that is why having a strong social network contributes to your longevity, contributes to your well-being, because that feeling that you get when you think about that, that feeling of being known and being cared for really is good for your health, turns out. So that's the concept of a MOI. Now let's, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we translate that into our American culture, um, since we can't go back in time and put us all into these beautiful small groups. We do have a way that we kind of try to utilize that concept in our communities. Hello, Melinda, uh, California. I'm checking the chat. What did people say? Did anyone get it? Oh, 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 let's see. I'm not sure where I can look at that. Hang on a sec. There were quite a few that did. Did people get it? Okay, you'll have to tell me, John, if they got it right. So here's what it is. So located just a few hours east of LA, same air, right? No special genes going on there in Loma Linda, California. Um, and yet, they're a blue zone, home to some of the longest living people in the world and definitely to uh, in the United States. So this area is populated by a large concentration of Seventh-day Adventists. And due to their incredible health statistics, Seventh-day Adventists have been subject to one of the largest epidemiology studies ever conducted in America. And I know a few people that are still a part of that study, perhaps you all do too. Um, what, this is what they found. The average woman living in the United States lives to be about 80. They get a whole nother good nine years in, in Loma Linda, California. For the average man uh, in the United States lives to be about 76. And there they're living to be about 87 on average, right? They also have a, a nice concentration of, of centenarians. So what are they doing exactly? Well, they focus on friends, family, support um, on, for each other's healthy lifestyles. They've got being vegetarian written right into their religion. That is part of, of their religion. Um, but they also practice the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is really interesting. Every sp Saturday, they spend time, what we call downshifting, get out of high gear where we're usually operating and downshift and really take that time to again just focus on friends family their their faith um, their spiritual practice and you know oftentimes they're doing what they're actually doing on that day is going for through for nature hikes together do, having plant-based potlucks together um, so very very nice well-being practices they also have a strong sense of purpose even through their elder years and this is different than our communities, right? It's like once the career is over, just hanging out, right? So this is, this is very different. Indiv individuals in this community have a very strong sense of purpose. And I think Ellsworth Wareham, who's featured here, is a really great example of that. He is, in this photo, he is 97 years old. And he's building, so he wanted to build a privacy fence around his beautiful property you can see there, there in Loma Linda. And he put it out for a bid to see, you know, who wants to build the fence. He, the bid, lowest bid, I think, was $6,000. And he said, you know what? I'm going to build it myself. 97 years old. He's out there, probably hot, right? Southern California, building his fence, I guess, depending on what time of year. Three days later, he's pictured here. Now, if you've seen me do this presentation before, you already know, but. Dr. Ellsworth Wareham, right here, it continues to perform open heart surgery until he's about 103 when he decides time to retire. And now he is an exceptional person. And in the plant-based community, people often know about Dr. Ellsworth Wareham. He is quoted to say that he knows he is heart attack proof because he's not taking in any animal products. He's taking no cholesterol. Uh, he 
uh, is, is certainly fantastic, but not necessarily an exception in Loma Linda, California. That strong sense of purpose, that strong sense of being valued in their community. They continue to, to see that and to experience that far into their elder years. Now, the last two uh, blue zones in, in the world that we think we know of, and they, the demographers think that they've pretty much figured that this is it probably for now, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, which is such a beautiful place to visit. I was there last year. Um, and Icaria, Greece, um, both wonderful places. And if you're interested in learning more about these places, um, these are the books that have been written about it. Again, the National Geographic Magazine, the Blue Zones, just, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this one here is um, really just kind of a basic overview, really fun, easy, nice read. And then these subsequent books, um, this one's a little bit more about the diet. And then the Blue Zones of Happiness is also a really fun one. And I think all of them are on audiobook. So, um, you know, check those out if you're interested. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a recap of um, what we just talked about. So what are they doing? The Power Nine is a cross-cultural distillation of those well-being best practices that they have across those Blue Zones. These are things that any of us can do no matter where we live. So we don't have to live in a blue zone, although that would be nice. And we're working on improving our communities to be more like those places. But we can do them right, right at where you're sitting. So just a recap of what we saw. The shoe represents that natural movement, incorporating movement throughout your day. So again, uh, it may not mean uh, you know, intense exercise, but if can you can you pick up gardening? Can you walk to the your friend's house instead of driving? Can you bike to work instead of uh, driving to work? Can you get on the floor and play with the grandkids? Basically, we've been really expert at engineering movement out of our day. How can we bring that back in? The next tier we have things related to our outlook. We call it right outlook. Now this little puzzle piece represents purpose. We don't spend a lot of time in our lives reflecting on what our, how our gifts, our values, and our passions come together to form our unique purpose. And then what's more, how we can be applying that uh, in our work, in our, to our communities, in our families. Because we know that if people live their purpose, if they do what we call living an on-purpose life, that can add seven good years to your life. So really important to be reflecting on what your purpose is. Now this little meditator stands for that concept of downshifting, getting out of high gear and really trying to do a practice that helps you relax, a healthy practice that helps you relax on a regular basis. So what do you like to do that's healthy, that allows you to downshift and how can you incorporate that into your life on a daily basis? The next tier is all about what we call eating wisely. So you've got this little dial here with the fork at about 80%, that reminder to only eat until you're about 80% full, not stuffing yourself. The carrot, plant, slant, and I think if you're on this webinar, you're, you, you know about that and you're getting support in doing that. Uh, so wonderful, again, the community, the longest living communities in the world are about 95% plant-based. So if anyone tells you that being plant-based is some kind of new fad or trend, you can tell them that this is uh, you know, historically proven in the blue zones. And then that wine glass could easily be swapped out for a coffee cup because it's really about friends at five. Of course, the, the Sardinians, they do it with a, a, a small glass of red wine, high in antioxidants and polyphenols. But if you wanna do it with some green tea like they do in Okinawa or whatever you wanna do, a green smoothie, um, it's really about getting together with friends and again, investing in that network. And that's the foundation of the pyramid right here. The heart re represents putting loved ones first or, or family first. Uh, investing in your faith. The National Geographic researchers found that uh, if you participate in your faith-based uh, organization, you can add four to 14 years to your life. And you can imagine why that would be participating in a community and kind of being a part of a multi-generational uh, thing every week. And then this one over here, this is about surrounding yourself with people that encourage you to make healthy choices, okay? Finding that community that encourages you to make healthy choices. Maybe people that help you stay on purpose. Maybe people that help you support you uh, in your plant-based journey. 
Uh, maybe people that'll go on a walk with you once a week or a bike ride or a hike. So making sure you have those people in your life that are actually gonna encourage you to take steps forward in making healthy choices. So we also know though, that if we all walk away from this presentation and say, yes, okay, I'm gonna do three of those things. I'm just, I'm gonna rock it for the next, you know, I'm just gonna do this forever. Usually the willpower starts to wane at some point. And it really is too much to ask of all of us as individuals to try to maintain this kind of healthy lifestyle um, indefinitely. And so we know, we call the life radius, uh, that, that space where we spend most of our time um, throughout our days. And we, we, we recognize that people spend about 95% of their time within five miles of either where they work or where they live. And so we are to make changes to those places, to our work sites, restaurants, grocery stores, schools, faith-based organizations, and of course to our homes. And we're going to actually really support people in the long run in making healthy choices. If we make little tweaks that nudge people toward making healthy choices, instead of making those choices so difficult, right, that we'll be much more likely to be successful in the long run. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that looks like in communities. And maybe I'll just take a pause to see uh, if we've got any quick questions. I, okay, I'm seeing the chat here. Oh, yes, I see that people got, oh, a lot of people saw that it was Adventus. Um, let me scroll down. And people knew about the, the plant-based element of the Adventus. Great. So go ahead. If you have questions, you can stick them in the chat, and I will try to remember to take a look at that every now and then, and I will definitely look at it at the end. Okay, so... Blue Zones Project, right? So there's Blue Zones, those longevity hotspots. Blue Zones Project is what takes those concepts and implements it into communities that are not Blue Zones, that are not longevity hotspots. And the first pilot was in Albert Lee, Minnesota. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of about what that looks like. And it coincidentally is about a similar sized community to the one that I live in, in Roseburg. What they found after implementing these Blue Zones project nudges that I talked about across those sectors and the life radius, using the power nine, all these new concepts, right, uh, that they found really stunning results. They saw an increase in lifespan of almost three years. That's an incredible thing to do, especially because trends across the United States are actually going down. So even just to hold steady at this point is actually quite impressive. They saw almost 50% decrease in healthcare claims. So folks that you know, own businesses, you're gonna wanna you know, take a note of that one. 36% drop in smoking, 8.6 million annual healthcare cost savings, and they jumped to 34th place out in, in their county health rankings, up from 68. So quite a leap out of 87 counties. So, what exactly do we do in these communities? Well, we have to impact people and that's kind of what this is, right? Like inspire people, educate people on what we can all be doing. Talk about that power and I think about which elements of those we're doing well in and or in which elements we need to recommit to or further explore. So working with people, these are some local photos from my community. Inviting people to move more, discover their purpose, eat better, make new friends, so, okay, here are some wins from across North America. Major drops in hot and childhood obesity in California. Increase in people who say they're thriving in their life evaluation in Fort Worth. Um, an increase in people who are proud of their community. That's important, right? You need to feel proud of where you live to have good well-being. 10% drop in daily stress. 8% increase in the number of residents who learn to do something interesting daily. That's kind of related to having your life's purpose. Now, if you're wondering how we, we capture this data, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. In our community, over the last three years, we've engaged 6,500 people in a few different things. Um, almost 5,000 have taken a personal pledge to live longer better. That means they go through some specific action items of things that they can do related to the Power Nine. Um, and that's about 10% of our total, total population. So can imagine reaching, the goal, reaching that tipping point, right? Where you're really starting to create a culture of well-being. Okay, MOIs, I told you I'd tell you, how do we, how do we actually translate that concept into our uh, American culture? So we invite people to form small groups of about five to 10 people 
and meet together once a week for 10 weeks around three healthy behaviors. They can either walk together for 10 weeks, they can uh, have a plant-based potluck together once a week for 10 weeks, or they can explore purpose with a light curriculum that we provide for 10 weeks. And we hope that after 10 weeks, they've formed a lasting bond with those folks in the community, and that they've also developed a new behavior pattern. Uh, so we've had about 500 people complete a 10-week Moai in our community. At about 600 people participate in a purpose workshop, which we provide for free for the community. And we've had uh, almost, a, you know, almost 900 people have volunteered, uh, resulting in uh, over 5,000 volunteer hours. Because we also know that when people volunteer together, that they are participating in something in the community that they feel good about. They're being productive. They're working alongside of other people that are feeling positive and um, enriching their life with whatever they're doing. It's also an opportunity for people to use their purpose if they don't have a ready avenue for that in their, in their workplace or if they're retired. Um, here are some of the, uh, the results from those MOIs, some surveys that we did. Over 80% of people that took the MOI survey reported making a new long-term friend in their MOI. And again, that's so important when we know we're all combating um, isolation and loneliness. Some of the, the testimonies we got, people said that it was an excellent community program. They lost a few pounds too. Uh, they have jeans they haven't been able to wear for months that now fit. They've enjoyed making new friends. Um, that's the highlight of their week. They, they love their purpose workshop group. They slept better on days where they walked. They made great connections. They have a new sense of community. It's so really a, a sweet uh, way to, to support uh, connection in a community. Community volunteerism is up. This is a fun photo of a uh, river cleanup that we did in, in partnership with some of our environmental organizations locally. Oh, you know what? I meant to ask John earlier if I was going to be able to play a video. I'm just going to click on it and see what happens. This may not work, guys, and that's okay. I would be happy to send it out um, after this, this presentation, but let's just try it. Do you guys see a YouTube video loading right now? No. Just the link. Just the link. Okay, what happens if I go like this? And, and because there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with this, and I meant to test it earlier, but the sound could also not work. Do you still, do you not see it still? No, don't Bad way to ask that question. Okay, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to um, just skip it and I'll send out the link. That, this is a testimony from a uh, high school, alternative school student who uh, was the recipient of a purpose workshop and just gave a, a fantastic testimony of her experience after um, being a part of that purpose workshop. So I'll share that with you if anyone's interested. It's a really beautiful um, experience that she shared. Okay, so again, it's not just about people. We do need to inform and inspire people of the possibilities, but we also need to make sure that when they go to the places where they spend the most time, that it's not impossible or even difficult to make healthy choices. Now, many kids, at least when I was growing up, we walked to school, right? That is not the case often nowadays. So we're trying to provide safe routes to school, giving kids uh, a safe way to walk to school. We also need to just get them out trying it. And so we do these uh, walking school buses. This is kind of a fun thing. The kids just love carrying the school bus. They're walking the school <laughs> bus instead of riding the school bus. It's really sweet. Um, this is a big walk to school day. You can see the, you know, there's a teacher out there and a, a fireman out there. But really giving kids a chance to enjoy this experience because it's quite rare now, um, you know, with, with poor built environment choices and, um, you know, I guess maybe a greater fear of crime and, you know, just when, when more parents start driving their kids to school, then more parents start driving their kids to school because it's not, there's just so many cars and it's so congested that it just doesn't feel safe for kids. It's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, we've heard from principals that kids' behavior is better on the days where they walk to school. It also gives them a chance to connect, which is really important for children as well. Gets them a chance to get their yayas out, as my mom would say. Uh, school, oops, I flip-flop these slides here. So schools, work sites, restaurants, grocery stores, and 
faith-based organizations, these are the places where we tend to spend a lot of our time and what would happen if we made tweaks to these environments. So these are local photos from a local elementary school. That's the principal and the manager of one of our favorite grocery stores here. And then just to zoom out to an example from across the country, this is a, a big hospital in Southwest Florida. That's a Blue Zones Project Demonstration Community. They created a workplace culture, an environment that inspired employees to feel better and do their best, and thus saw a nearly three-point jump in overall well-being amongst employees, 54% decrease in healthcare expenditures over six years, and a $27 million savings during the three-year period. So again, fortunately, what's good for individuals is also good for the bottom line. Those two things are not in conflict. Um, in our community, 19 of our top 20 largest work sites have engaged with our, our Blue Zones project um, initiative. 12 of the top 20 work sites um, have uh, completed the criteria to become a Blue Zones project approved work site. So that means they've, they've implemented lots of great well-being tweaks and nudges to their organizations to support their employees in being healthy at work. So that might look like, you know, giving people the opportunity to take micro breaks, having access to water really easily, encouraging people to take the stairs, encouraging uh, people to be able to spend time with family as is appropriate, um, having healthy options in the cafeteria or even free healthy snacks in the break room. So lots of great things like that happening. Um, 14 employers have implemented wellness committees, so committees that are just focused on the well-being of their work site. Um, our Roseburg VA hired the first whole health coordinator in the country dedicated to employee wellness um, and Blue Zones project initiatives are very excited about that. It's just important to make that a priority, right, to bring that to the table when leadership is meeting. Restaurants, this is really fun and I think people will resonate this with, on this call. When you go to a restaurant, you want to have really good healthy options, right? You want to have, more specifically, I'll say you want to have plant-based options or even vegan options. And so we've worked with restaurants around our community to ensure that they have those options and that they're readily available on the menu, easy to identify, not more expensive than their, you know, animal product containing counterparts, that they're, and that they're good. They have to taste good too. So we had a, have a lot of fun with working with these different restaurants. Um, this is a Lebanese restaurant. Um, and so they've done just a really great job augmenting their offerings. This is us celebrating them. Again, zooming out, here's one from, um, I believe this is in Texas. Buffalo West is known for their ribs, steaks, and upscale comfort food. And they saw a rise in sales after becoming a Blue Zones Project approved restaurant. Their salad bar now makes up 70% of their lunch business. Their price per person average increased from eight to nine dollars per person. And they saw a 20% revenue increase. And so the thing is with these restaurants, their business increases, their business improves when they um, start to, to change the, their options and prioritize well-being. We just got another local restaurant that gave us that testimony that this tipping point and change in culture has more people asking for and demanding healthy options at their restaurant. So now they're wanting to get on board with Blue Zones Project. So that's very exciting. Um, this is a, a local Indian restaurant and they were known for their home style Indian food and they saw a rise in their sales after working with us. They now offer lower fat and healthy dairy alternatives. Um, uh, dairy alternatives, meaning um, non-animal product, dairy, uh, you know, plant milks, uh, reduced salt and oil offerings, and they saw a 35% revenue increase after becoming a Blue Zones Project approved restaurant. This is just a little tiny mom and pop restaurant, so you can just imagine, um, you know, what, how meaningful that is. Um, loggers, they saw, this is actually um, a soy curl chicken sandwich here. Um, so they, they saw their Blue Zones project approved items like this and their Impossible Burger, those items rose from two to three sales a week to 27 a week after 10 months. So, and you guys, we're in Roseburg. This is rural Oregon, right? So we're really proud to see these little changes here. Really excited about it. Same with grocery stores. Um, this is a really cool story. This is actually a um, convenience store. This is just a, a corner market. Um, JIT, the owner, was receptive to partnering with us and 
This convenience store is located in Southeast Roseburg, right in downtown, which is a food desert. So if you're not familiar with that term, it means there's no access to fresh produce in this part of town. So if you don't have a car and you're reliant on public transportation, it can take you hours to go to the grocery store to get pro, uh, fresh produce. So that is not making the healthy choice the easy choice. So we partnered with this convenience store to get a produce cooler and offer some select produce um, that we restock every week to make sure they, you know, we call it Tasty Fresh Tuesdays is the day that everyone knows that this, this uh, convenience store is now stocked with fresh produce just to kind of do a little stop gap. Ultimately, we'd love to have a nice um, grocery store in that area, part of town, but this is a, a way that folks that live in the, you know, residences in right nearby can come and get access to fresh produce. So really a fun uh, project. We also, they were, they were um, kind enough to allow us to put in some fun prompts. This used to be some sugar sweetened beverage um, promotions here up on the banner. We, we changed it to show fruits and vegetables. Welcome to downtown market. We, you can see us down here power washing and um, just cleaning up the place. So that's also giving people an opportunity to volunteer. And again, zooming out, maybe some of you have heard of Foodland grocery stores. Um, are now Blue Zones, one third of them are Blue Zones project approved and they have a goal of reaching 100% Blue Zones project approval. They've seen a 12% increase in their natural food sales and 6% increase in produce sales on average across their store. So more people buying fresh fruits and vegetables, it's very exciting. And this is Sherm, so we, we have healthy checkout stands now. Now a lot of people are tempted when they go through the healthy check, the, the regular checkout stand, right, to do those last minute impulse buys. So why not have them impulse buy some healthy things? We've got fruit here, we've got nuts, um, we've got water here in the cooler, and we've also worked with them on making some vegan grab and go um, sandwiches to put in there as well. So that's just our one of our local uh, projects here at Sherm. Um, and then, you know, we, we see this in our work sites as well. So we saw, see an, an Albert Lee employer saw an 8.6, so Albert Lee, remember that's that pilot over in Minnesota. They saw an $8.6 million savings in annual health care costs thanks to a 35% decrease in tobacco use. So we're getting into some of our um, policy work here. Tobacco is just one of those things. And then high V grocery store, they had a, saw 122% healthy beverage sales increase, 15% produce sales increase, 25% fruits and vegetables sold in the salad bar. So, and these are, these are just some of the um, big organizations across North America that Blue Zones Project works with. Um, and then I have some of our local organizations that we're working with here, some of our larger local organizations. So we also work besides those places, as we call them, those, um, you know, life radius, uh, work sites, restaurants, grocery stores, schools, faith-based organizations. We also work in three policy areas. So we work in built environment. And if folks aren't familiar with that term, I just define it as making it safe and attractive to move about and spend time outdoors. Um, for built environment nerds, this is Dan Burden. He is fantastic. So you may, people may have heard of them if they're interested in, in built environment. Um, so again, built environment, tobacco, and food policy are our three policy areas that we try to impact. I already talked a little bit about some of our tobacco policy work. We were able to, uh, we were awarded $2.25 million in grant funding to support, again, safe routes to school. Remember making it safe for kids to, to get to school. Our tobacco policies community work, work on campaigns like Keep Roseburg Beautiful, and they're putting up cigarette butt receptacles here be, so that there's not cigarette butts everywhere downtown. Also working on a downtown uh, smoke-free policy and a This Is Quitting Youth Vaping Cessation program, since that's becoming just such a, a difficult thing to deal with, the, the vaping, and it's skyrocketing right now. We have a Veggie RX program, which means I can go to my doctor and um, if I'm food insecure, I'm suffering for chronic, from chronic illness, I will be giving, a per, been, be giving a prescription that instead of taking to the pharmacy, I take to a farmer's market and I can exchange the prescription or the vouchers that they're given for fresh produce. So that's Veggie RX program. And it's just so fantastic. We're in our third year of the program. So people get that for six months and we measure them at the beginning and at the end in a couple of different ways to see what kind of increase and impact they have. 
We have a mobile food pantry to reach people in outlying areas that are food insecure. And then, um, you know, we do things like movie nights, showing forks over knives and, you know, doing healthy shopping tours and stuff like that. And we did that during World Food Week last year. Um, I kind of talked about safe routes to school, so I'm just going to jump through that. Here are some of the things that have, haven't happened in other areas in policy. Smoking dropped by 36% in the beach cities. That's just huge. Um, no smoking in cars when minors are present was a policy that was passed across Oahu and Maui. Um, built environment work on uh, in Albert Lee saw a 25% increase in downtown property values and 96% increase in pedestrian traffic. So I don't know how it is in uh, Vancouver with your downtown, but I know for us here, we had a high vacancy rate in our downtown. So people would walk downtown, a lot of vacant buildings. That's not very conducive to good pedestrian traffic, right? Um, so making better built environment near downtown as it did in Albert Lee can attract people to spend time out downtown. And their vacancy rate, rate went way down in Albert Lee after um, creating some really nice paths, parklets, pedlets, stuff like that. Um, all right, so what are some major outcomes um, that can happen? Fort Worth is one of the, the largest Blue Zones project demonstration communities. Their um, metro area equivalent ranking, which is kind of like our county health ranking, they improved to 58th from 185th between 2014 and 2017. And again, I mentioned this, that the trends are really um, in a downward um, trend right now, kind of redundant, but trends are going down for well-being across the United States. So just to hold steady is really um, a, a success. To be able to increase is the way that you can get that kind of jump. 17% um, increase in residents who exercise 30 minutes or more, three days or week or more, or, or, or per week or more. 3% increase in consumption of five or more servings of produce a week. So really tangible increases here. A couple of these, Beach City saw 10% risk reduction over five year period, saving their coastal communities more than 42 million. Klamath Falls down here in Oregon proved uh, change was possible by winning the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Prize. So again, this is happening across the United States. Um, right, right now we have two active communities in uh, Oregon, Blue Zones Project Umqua, which is ours here in Roseburg, and then Blue Zones Project Klamath Falls. So, um, there are, you know, it's happening, we have 51 communities, and I'll talk about that here in a second across the United uh, North America. The Umpqua Valley has seen 46% uh, fewer risks than expected based on the Oregon State trends. So again, talking about the trends, we have 5% fewer risks than we thought we were going to have. Oh, I thought I had another slide on that, highlighting that. Um, oh, shoot. I think they were in nutrition. Yeah, and uh, life evaluation um, were two of our big ones, and then in exercise. So we're doing better than we were expected to do. And you know what that means? That's usually got a dollar sign attached to it because when you have risks in health and you translate that out into what that's going to cost in medical costs, it, we're saving money. So of course, it costs money to implement programs like this, but in the end, you're, you're saving money. So again, 51 communities across North America, and here's roughly where those communities are located. Hmm. Oh yeah, okay, so I did pull them out here. We saw 22% less risk in poor nutrition, 8% less risk in lack of exercise, and 24% less risk in life, life evaluation. Okay, here is another video that I won't be able to play, but I'll send it out in the links. This just is a really nice, produ nicely produced video of some of our outcomes that we see in our community. And sometimes it's just nice to see these things visually at play in a community. So I'm wrapping up here, guys. I'm going to take questions now. This is a fun uh, visual from our kickoff in our community three years ago. We had the high school marching band out and invited people to come out and learn about our new community well-being initiative. We had uh, was it 800 people come out to learn about a community well-being initiative. We didn't even have free pizza or anything like that. So we're pretty proud of 
having that kind of turnout for something like this. Okay, I am pulling up the chat. I would love, oops, oh, that's okay. What can you see now? Do you see my screens? We see you. Just me, okay, that's fine. Okay, um, let's see what questions we have now. Thank you, Sally. Um, I'm actually not seeing any. There's one. How, here we go, Catherine. How are Blue Zones Project Cities areas selected? Okay, good question. Um, I'll tell you how ours was selected, then I'll tell you how I think if someone is interested on this call and potentially exploring that possibility, how you might go about that. For us, uh, we Klamath Falls was the first demonstration community. Um, our governor, not our current governor, previous governor, um, a while back, actually, Governor Kitzhaber got into, I guess, a bet with the governor of Iowa, who there are seven demonstration communities in Iowa. And the goal was to see if we could raise our state uh, health rankings in comparison to the rest of the, you know, the states in, around the country. And so Blue Zones Project was selected as a mechanism for improving our statewide well-being um, through working with individual communities. And so Klamath Falls was the first. Um, and then there was the opportunity to have another community join in. Well, they opened up the application process and so many communities applied. Uh, I believe there were nine uh, competitive applicants. And so they, they kind of, you know, finagled the, the finances and um, you know, tried to figure out how they could run things efficiently with onboarding three new communities at the same time. And so those are called the Wave 2 Communities. So Blue Zones Project Umqua, Blue Zones Project Grants Pass and Group Blue Zones Project, the DAOs, you're probably familiar with the DAOs, um, all became part of Wave 2 Communities. Um, it takes funding, right? You are, you are putting a team together, you're putting a program budget together, um, you're doing a pretty hefty discovery process where you do a community assessment to kind of see where the strengths and weaknesses are. Um, you're, you're going to be doing ongoing measurement, um, community-wide measurement to see progress. So those things do cost money. And so the, be the, the best way to start to approach something like this would be to really get your high leadership on board, the city, um, you know, private sectors, foundation, CEOs and presidents of your largest employees, uh, any foundations that you have, any, um, you know, big funders, uh, you know, political uh, representatives, your, you know, commissioners, your representatives. Um, it's, it's really important to rally everyone because what you're going to do is say as a community, we want to all together share this one objective and invest in this, this one thing. Um, because, you know, you're going to be needing to all pool together funding, but also, um, you know, the political will is important as well. You've got to have the doors open. You've got to be able to make the most of the opportunity and, and at least enough people need to be on board to make sure that that can happen. Um, we do have a Blue Zones Project Central team that helps support all of the communities in starting and sharing the model and ongoing training and resources, which is really fantastic. So they would be the ones to approach for something like that. And I'd be happy to make that connection if someone felt like they were um, interested and ready to do that. Oh, lots, lots of questions are popping up now. Okay. Um, Linda says, how did the project get started in Roseburg? Okay, I answered that. Gail says, what were those other two blue zones, Aries and Oregon, which were on the map? Okay, I just mentioned that. Yes, the Dells um, finished phase one of the, um, Blue Zones Project, and we have also just finished our phase one. That means three years of Blue Zones Project, and now we are transitioning into phase two. This um, isn't always the case with communities. Sometimes communities say, okay, we've got the model launched. Now we are going to sort of decentralize it. Different organizations are going to take on different pieces, and we're going to move with that momentum. Um, Paul, is there a list of participating restaurants in Southern Oregon? How do you suggest improving social circle during the pandemic? Thank you. Yes, there is a list of participating restaurants in Oregon. 
Um, I would be happy to share that with John. Would that be the best way to do something like that? I'd be I'd be happy to do that. Um, and improving social circle during the pandemic. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, we all have, I think, sort of our limited physical, you know, interactions that we have. And, um, and I guess what I mean by that is people that we are seeing. Um, so making, you know, I like, for example, for me, it's my sister. Um, so I'm seeing my sister as, as often as I can. But utilizing, if you can, the technology, which is not something that we would normally suggest, but in this case it is, utilizing Zoom and FaceTime and, um, you know, different ways where you actually see each other's faces and then actually scheduling events together, scheduling a, a virtual game night, scheduling a virtual friends at five and actually doing that regularly. Um, you know, I don't know exactly where things are at right now with Vancouver, but if you can do social distance, get togethers where you can maybe get meet in a park and maintain social distance and do a little pick park picnic, you know, stuff like that. If you can do a walk together, we're able to maintain social distance. A bike ride is really a nice way to do that because usually you're, you're a good distance apart anyway. So absolutely. It's a great question, Paul. Um, we should be trying to do what we can so that we don't, you know, um, end up degrading our well-being during this time. Uh, Yes, Catherine, that's a good question. Um, I think, like I said, it's really just about the communities being able to get on the same page with that. It is a bit of work. Um, we had letters of support from all of our big community leaders in order to become a Blue Zones project demonstration community. Um, you may need to restate the question. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. She's just asking about um, more communities becoming demonstration communities and she's asking about Portland and I would say Portland would be a big undertaking you'd have to have a really big team to start to you know I mean not that I think Portland is well advanced um, from to where we are at but to really be able to like make a dent in that kind of community to have to have a sizable team probably more comparable to uh, Fort Worth and of course there's already that model to work off of is there a sustainability plan once the funding ends? Um, and so, yeah, each community, that's Teresa from Teresa. Yes, um, well, each community decides to handle it differently. So as I mentioned before, we are moving into phase two. So we are going to continue. We have a smaller team with room for expansion with um, grant funding. Um, the idea is that Blue Zones Project kind of launches the community into this well-being model, but it's not necessarily that it's supposed to last forever. Ideally, you know, different community organizations would step up and take a piece of the work going forward for sustainability. Um, Sandy says, I noticed that there are very few people of color in the pictures from your events. Why do you think that is? Thank you for pointing that out, Sandy. That's something that's of particular interest to me. Um, why do I think that is? Uh, I don't want to give an excuse that we have uh, a very white community here in rural Oregon, but I, I do think that that is a part of it. Um, we have specific uh, efforts in our blueprint, which is what we work off of, to try to go out and reach um, uh, different demographics in our community and um, you know it's just it's it takes more work it's harder it's something where we I personally want to do we want to do it's a goal of ours but um, I think you know well-being sometimes unfortunately is not a first priority when you're struggling to you know put food on the table and when you're struggling with having housing and that kind of thing and so um, I think that's just sort of a natural challenge when you're trying to invite people to think about their, their personal well-being. You have to first provide for some of those basic needs. I will say, though, that we have had some really nice wins. We have some partnerships with the tribe. Um, our Cow Creek tribe was one of our first organizations to become Blue Zones Project approved. Um, I've had some great success working with our Spanish-speaking population here. We did a plant-based cooking class in Spanish. 
uh, last year, we also did um, a couple of presentations in Spanish. I do speak Spanish, so that's an advantage that our team has. But I think it's an ongoing challenge. One of the things that I try to do since I do our engagement in marketing is just to try to um, include people of color in our marketing and in our imagery. So thank you for calling me out on that. I will um, try to include the photos at least where we do have um, more diversity into the slide deck in the future because I absolutely think that's so important that we sh uh, show, you know, representation of our and, and celebration of our diversity in our communities. So great question, Sandy. Dan says stress is a major negative factor due to long Major, major negative factor to longevity. How do people in blue zones address stress in their lives to help neg negate the impact on their future longevity? Dan, I think the probably the most straightforward answer um, regarding stress is just that downshift power nine element. Um, you know, in se the Seventh-day Adventist population, they're using the Sabbath and specifically to recover from the stresses of the work week, really taking that as a day off. I know oftentimes for us, the weekend is just, you know, shifting to a different kind of work, right? Or maybe we're still working if we're not disciplined, like, you know, I am sometimes. Um, but, you know, taking that day as a, as a true break from, uh, from those stressors, finding healthy ways to incorporate relaxation into your life, whether that's a daily meditation or you know, taking micro breaks at work or going for a walk or, you know, I find tremendous relief from biking to and from work. Um, I notice that if I drive home from work, I still need that transition to relax when I get home. But if I bike, um, that kind of naturally serves as a good transition. I feel refreshed and I'm sort of in a different mental space when I do that versus when I'm driving. So looking for those ways to do that. We all know exercise is good for our mental well-being. Gardening is huge for that. Um, so I think all of those things, all of the power nine elements, you know, getting together with friends, doing that friends in five, and, you know, maybe verbally kind of having that cathartic moment with your friends and um, sharing your woes and ups and downs. All of those things, I think, um, the more we implement them, the more we are able to um, combat chronic stress. I also am a strong believer in kind of trying to reflect on the root of stress and really address those things directly as well. Um, you know, there's just no substitute for, you know, if you have something that's chronically causing you stress in your life to, to address that directly. But in addition to that, and just the regular stresses of life, I think that those things are, that I suggested are a good um, way to go. I think that's that's the last question I see. That was from Dan. Any other questions, folks? That was the last one that I saw also. Okay. Well, you all, thank you so much for having me. I love sharing about this topic. I have a few things that I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share a restaurant list. I'm gonna share the links to the two videos with John. Thank you all. It's been such a pleasure sharing with us. Thank you for having me. I wanted to come up and do this presentation in, per, um, in person. And this actually worked out really well for me. I just only wish I could have seen all your faces, but I appreciate being invited and um, hope to see you again sometime. Outstanding, very yeah. outstanding. And I want you to know that there were plenty of comments that talked about how good this presentation was. Oh, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. And Appreciate all